Right, so I'm, for, I'm a manager of Full Motor Company. I work um, in the research and advanced. Of, uh, I work in a research and advanced organization, um, and I have an organization that does the system engineering and controls for the autonomous vehicles, electrified vehicles, hybrids, plugins. Um, and this is really exciting. I have about 100 engineers, and uh, of which are probably 60 PhDs. So it's a really uh, fabulous group. Now, what we're all sort of working on is this notion that we're looking at being the most trusted mobility company uh, in the world. And to do that, we need to understand how to bring all of these different environments together. You know, the the, the, the uh, cities of the world, cityscapes, how we look at the transportation as a service type solutions. And this is the ultimate systems engineering challenge, uh, certainly from my perspective. For a lot of you guys in the aerospace industry, um, I know that this, a lot of these things you've been doing uh, for many years, but for us in accelerated mode, this is quite exciting. So we bring a lot of the same types of work you've been doing with us together, um, breakneck speed, essentially. And model based systems engineering is fundamental to this. So my talk, I'm going to go through a lot of material, not like these guys, they did a really good job with a few slides. Um, because of my inability, I need more time. Our job is, my job is to basically convince you that model-based systems engineering is required for complex systems engineering challenges, and uh, to deliver this is exactly what we need. The other thing I want to talk about real briefly, which is a completely a contrast from Nancy Levinson from MIT, has um, put a couple of papers out about systems of systems. Um, and I, I think Nancy Levinson's a fabulous engineer, and again, I, we bow our hat to how we work with the 25, 30 years of Ford Motor Company on safety systems. Um, and she really doesn't like this notion of systems of systems. And she's absolutely correct. I read her paper, but I mean, she's perfectly correct. It is a system. We still want to talk about systems of systems, I'll explain why we go through it. It helps. So it's just a different mental model. And I'll explain why, at Ford, it makes sense for us to think of systems of dis distinct systems. So, um, just trying to build on this notion of do we have a complex world in the automotive is comparable to the sort of complexity that you guys have been working with. Um, in the automotive world in motion, which is a derivative work from the um, uh, Incozy 2025 vision, you know, there's four chapters there. We added the fourth. Basically, it goes through all the mega trends that are happening in the world, looking at what do those mega trends, what the impacts do they have on systems engineering in different realms. We looked at specifically from the automotive realm. Bottom line, chapter four, we look at what is the future state, how do we get there? And one of the major elements are looking at this sort of systems of system focus because of the complexity of all of the different challenges that are coming our way to build on. So in that final chapter, it sort of looked at the mega trends that have specific impacts on the automotive world. And so as you go through it, you know, having sustainability on environmental um, you know, the propulsion units, do we use hydrogen fuel cells, electric, fully electric, or how many sort of um, lithium ion batteries do we put together? Connectivity, the internet of things. In order to survive now with this uh, connected set of transportation as a service, you've got to understand what does this internet of things mean? How do we leverage it? How can we monetize um, for motor company getting autonomous type vehicle systems into a transportation network? that can satisfy multiple customers and different customers' needs. Um, ride sharing and, and car ride is a subset of that. How do we develop fleets of vehicles so that we can satisfy different customers' needs? Um, making an intelligent city or helping work together with different cities to understand what does it mean to be an intelligent city? How can we leverage the information that's contained within the cityscape to then enhance and also monetize transportation as a service and mobility as a service. So as we went through all of these things, and this is in the, the Automotive Vision 2025, which I recommend you get a copy of, it's about 100 pages of a pretty interesting read, and it comes up with this. We started looking at it from a model-based systems engineering perspective. Is it desirable to have MBSC or is it mandatory from our perspective? And, and let me tell you something about Ford Motor Company, just like GM and our other competitors, for us to implement model-based systems engineering, we have to show return on investment before we even start. We have to show it's a problem to be solved. It can only be solved with this type of analytical work. So when we did this, we sort of went through and we started looking at, at these are all things we're chasing, obviously, at Ford and so GM and others. Where is it required and where is it desired? So, sorry, back there you can see that it's fundamentally, you can apply it to all these aspects individually. To, 
to David Long's point, you don't want to be looking at isolated silos that are just integrated together. You need to have a coherent meta model and, and information data model for the relevant pieces, not all of it, for the relevant systems and engineering pieces that you need to have visibility into. So, it is complicated. We do need to find model based systems and engineering. And if we focus in on the autonomous vehicle, that to us is a particularly testing um, world. So, I don't know if you're familiar with this, you've got these different levels, level 0 through 5 of autonomy. And at each different level, there's different types of functionality that you can put into the vehicle. So the level 1 is sort of bank lock braking, traction control. <clears throat> level 2, you start putting in uh, automatic braking, steering, and uh, acceleration. So you've got drive-by-wire, brake-by-wire, steer-by-wire with some sort of intelligence under limited conditions. So the, the uh, driver still has to be engaged and still has to be mindful of what they're doing. Level three says, like Tesla, you can have your hands off the wheel for a period of time, short periods, 15, 20 seconds, but you still must be engaged. You know, we can't expect the vehicle to take over and to try to. Level four is saying, we can be fully automated with certain geofenced areas and with certain conditions, so that the vehicle will do all of the autonomous driving for you, including emergency braking and others. But you, you have to be aware that you might go out of a geofenced area, things might happen where you need to take control again. And then level five means basically the vehicle will do everything under every condition. You, you can turn your seats around and you can go and have a meal in the car if you want. Um, but all of these, each of these levels have different needs of awareness, situational awareness of the vehicle. It needs to know where it is geometrically, it needs to know where it is uh, situationally, and it needs to know where it is with respect to other vehicle systems. So when you look at the vehicle, the autonomous vehicle and its ecosystems, this is where we get this notion of systems of systems. And why I, we still are working with the term of systems of systems is that in the auto industry, we have to have massive reuse. That's how we scale. And so even on the autonomous platform, the um, laser pointer here, I don't think, but um, on the right hand side it says the AVP, the autonomous vehicle platform. That's kind of a traditional vehicle platform that we would build. On top of it, we put the virtual driver system. That's the artificial intelligence with all the neural nets and the you know, hierarchical um, sort of solutions that we, we have in there. We sit on top of the platform. And then we have the sort of service and controllers and all the sensors and actuators that go around it. So that's a system that we know pretty well. But that system has to cooperate with and interoperate with the transportation as a service, mobility as a service, any of the garage and fuel and depot systems. And those are all systems that are being developed individually outside of our sort of target autonomous. So we do have to interoperate with them. They are developing in their own right. And we need to know certain, we need to have inter you know, interoperability with certain things. So, so that's why we like to call it systems of systems, because there are well-defined distinct systems outside of our tip traditional that we have to have visibility and traceability into. So, this is what it looks like from a systems engineering perspective of our original sort of OEM. We've got all of the software, the program management, the CAE, vehicle controls, all working around various different systems uh, with data and information analysis that's going between them. And what we've sort of added now is we've got research labs in Palo Alto, we've got research labs in China, in Germany, we've got AI, deep learning, we've got um, robotics, image processing, cyber security expertise and systems that are now being integrated at a very rapid pace, I'd say, compared to traditional, that need to interoperate with these, or well, they need to have access and visibility into data. Uh, on the traditional side, and we need to have access to visibility and visibility into their data. Because the system safety, system security is an emergent system across all of these, as we all know. So this is where model-based systems engineering comes in, where we want to make sure we can start leveraging or interacting with that. So there's this paradigm shift that we're all aware of that's happening, where we went from mechanical drafting to where we were about 10 years ago, we sort of document-centric, we took it into objects, into a PLM system like Team Center, so we had all the requirements actually broken down, related to signals, parameters, devices, uh, transmission, the engines, and then we go into sort of doing our build and our B and B. But now we need to go to the next step, which is what we call this model-based systems engineering, which says, even though PLM, 
his model base, because you have to have a data model that relates requirements to specs, to cows, to conflicts, to tests. You need to have a formalized mechanism of capturing the models, that like David Long was talking about, that captures the relationships between not just the descriptive models, but also dynamic models you're using for test design and build um, at the right level. And then that goes through, has to be integrated with PLM systems, and then goes through to your build and VMV. And it's a very iterative process. So if you design and develop this MBSE, and it's fully integrated and agile, you can now do very quick iterations at the top end of the seesaw. Right? So early as, as early as you can in the design phase, you can identify issues that quickly. So we've gone very heavily about eight, six, eight years ago into um, SysML to capture the descriptive end. We've already had a lot of solutions with all the dynamic models, all of the CAC, CAD CAM, CAC 3P world. So we've got three-dimensional models. We've got the digital twins. Um, that's great for manufacturing and design. But when you're doing the early stuff, you really want to have models that also can relate with the information between all these different worlds, the requirements, parameters, studies, safety, reliability, quality, manufacturing, service. And so we've sort of linked together the SysML with all these dynamic models to the behavioral and all the dynamic structure. So you've got architectural views that go through. Now, the important distinction I'd make, though, is that and you have to be very thoughtful about what does MBSE mean to you? What's the critical to have linkages into? Not everything. So each one of these domains have their own world of very detailed analysis that they have to each unique. But there's a certain set of information that you need in systems engineering that you're in trade studies, you've got to have visibility into traceability. And so that's what we do with these system models. So it's a single source of truth that supports many stakeholders to David's uh, point. So you can get views which are unique and specific to the information that's pertinent to you. To Donna's point, not everybody wants to see everything in the model, so you have to be able to put the abstraction levels that are important to you so you can see them. The other important point I made, which resonates with me, having lived this, <laughs> the, the pre-commissioning of models is critical. And what I mean by that is, you have to have a level of integrity uh, of the model that you're, you're comfortable with. So you need to pre-test before you commit and build into this bigger ecosystem. And the other point I'm going to make is about the uh, social tank piece of it, where the cultural uh, aspects of these models, who made them, who's the expert, what trust level do you have, plays a significant role in how they use So we've gone from that to a disparate world, where everybody now is kind of working off of this model-based systems engineering, which is a SysML, Siemens Team Center, integrated world. So you've got the, the methods and tools together and then put the processes that into it. And this is where we are today for the autonomous vehicle. So you have Argo AI coming here, we have a high rotate team, we have all of our engineers around the world. So we haven't deviated from the fundamentals of systems engineering. We took the fundamental systems engineering pipeline, which is what we call it, our concept logical implementation, we go to define, analyze, <coughs> and verify. But we've captured all of the different models, and this is like an n dimensional space. You know, it could be, not that say for assembly models, it could be, it's, it's, uh, it's a whole bunch of different models. But they are linked at the right points. So when you make a change at any one point, you can see the impact analysis through all, you know how to do the verification validation. And that's pretty critical. So that framework is what we use to relate all the data. So I just took an example here. Well, AI, which is uh, for us, sorry, autonomous vehicles is really important to us. The functional safety and the cyber security are fundamentally emergent properties of the totally integrated <coughs> ecosystem. And those who can define that ecosystem with one fundamental basis of functions and features, which David pointed out, the three different domains in the room, define a function and a feature, it's really difficult. I think we've done it with some various approaches. But We've got this function and feature that goes across every domain, whether it's cyber security, functional safety, um, whether it's the service guys, whether it's uh, the commissioning or, or the monetization of transportation of service. So when somebody says, we want an autonomous vehicle fleet that can carry pizzas, and the next week they come in and say, oh, we also want it to now carry packages and people and 
oh, we needed to do these things. We can analyze very quickly, but anyway, so, so here's the functionalities that are over here, and we can analyze the hazards, the risks, which are also similar to the STPA, which is the state of the intended function. But you also be going back down to cybersecurity. So we've got a model, a data model that we work with the OEG to extend SysML, which is coming out with a new release, that captures all those fundamental objects and relationships. So that for a single backbone, you can do the what ifs, the trades. What happens if I change this feature of function? How many tests do I have to rewrite? How many lines of requirements do I have to do? Are there distributed impacts on my ECUs, on my cloud? Is it a cloud-based fog? Is it a cloud-based edge function services that are changing? These are things we never had to worry about before, but with these integrated structured models, we can now make light uh, decisions around impact of studies. So now we've gone from that sort of diverse, complex system, we've got it into the models. We can go through and we can do this early analysis and understanding. The user experience is absolutely fundamental. So what are our customers? What do they need to do? What do they want to do? What should we provide to them to, be, to enable them to do with our, our fleets or our individual vehicles? So that's the user experience. And that's captured in many different ways, but it's also encapsulated in the models. That then translates through the modeling loop, software loop, hardware loop, so that we can go through and we can define the user experiences down to sets of specifications, use cases, down into features and functions. The features and functions have the requirements and specs into allocated functions of code, whether it's on the target real time code on the vehicle, or whether it's an optical service out in the cloud, or whether it's some localized <coughs> um, domain cloud server. And then finally, we can do validation in hardware in the loop of the entire system before any hardware is built. And that's really important. So these high-powered compute systems that we're putting into these vehicles are really expensive. The LIDARs we put on top of these vehicles, on the systems are really expensive. We need to understand pretty clearly what's the performance criteria on those sensors, actuators, that we would expect in order to do safe operation of these vehicles. If they can't meet that performance criteria, how do we back down the operation uh, scope of the vehicle so that we explain you know, when is it available and when can we do it? So with all of this, we've got the functional system spec out of the models, we've got the verification of the functions and the safety, and we can do the validation, and then we can push that into actual production. So now this has all been verified and we push it now down through the PLM systems and we can then start manufacturing. So just to wrap up, um, in summary, these mega trends that we sort of analyzed, the urbanization, population growth, uh, reduction of pollution targets, trickle down into real technology and specific implementations that we're seeing in global cities. Um, where they're looking for highly automated intelligent cityscapes, integrated transportation and mobility <coughs> services, and autonomous vehicle solutions, which is creating the need to design safe and secure system solutions are very complex engineering problems. And that's why we think, from our perspective, to be successful in this endeavor, we must have a model based systems engineering solution. And I put in there, it's a, a thoughtful application of a well-structured, designed model based system engineering. And I just finish on that point. MBSC means many different things to many people, just like systems engineering. You, as a company, need to understand explicitly what does that mean to you? Where's the value in what you call model based systems engineering? So you need to understand how deep you go in each of, each of those different domains. What level of traceability do you need to make good decisions? And that might change in different projects, but you'll find there's a common core set of patterns you can explore. So that's me. Thank you.